probably can't all see them. It doesn't really matter. There's an awful lot of the great and good of the uh, autism field in the UK. And the, the only point I want to make is they're all UK. Because although, obviously, um, a knowledge of autism, knowledge and research in autism is global, when it comes to putting things into practice, we want to put into practice things using the instruments and structures that are present in the UK. So clearly it's the local knowledge there is important when it comes to our recommendations. So I'm not going to go through this list. Many of the names are probably quite well known to you. And the list is fluid. It can be added to if necessary if we experience gaps in our, that even these people can't, so can't address. So at the, in about a year's time, slightly less than a year's time, we hope to have produced an expert report, which might be called, we haven't decided, the economic and societal benefits of research and interventions in autism. And the expert report will then become the basis of a campaign to increase awareness among funders and government of the financial and societal benefits of increased investment and provide guidance on the best use of resources. So we're hoping to produce something that will be useful for government, where they a guidance on where they can uh, spend their money, but also I hope we'll provide ideas to the research charities uh, in developing their agenda for where they should put their funds. As I say, the National Autism Project itself won't be funding research, it won't be carrying out research, but what it will hope to be doing is to be advising other organisations on what they should be doing. So what will the report contain? Um, the main report will say what NAP is, why NAP is needed, it will expand on the things that I've explained so far, how the project was conducted, which I'll come to more in a moment. It will contain case studies, and I'll explain more again what those are, and our recommendations for interventions for increased investment or for changed investment, and perhaps also on pathways to implementation. And there I think we will need the expertise of people working out there in the community to explain. It's all very well making a recommendation, Perhaps you might need to tell someone how it might be put into practice. And the appendix will have the data analyses which have been carried out by the London School of Economics and then endorsements which I'll come to. So something like this is the idea of the report and maybe the, full re the main report itself will be no longer than 30 pages knowing the attention span of politicians limited. How has the work been carried out? It's basically, because we're not a research organisation, it's basically a literature review of effectiveness and cost-effectiveness of interventions. Before anyone asks me what effectiveness means, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, the information is being organised into tables summarising key information, the type of intervention, the country in which the data, from which the data were obtained, who the intervention is aimed at, what is the setting, is it, is it in the home, is it in school, education, or whatever. Evidence of effectiveness and cost-effectiveness, and the short and long-term impact, the timescale of these things is also important. Martin Knapp is very adept at mining data sets from other studies that impinge on, um, on these questions, even though those studies weren't necessarily set up in the first place to, uh, to, uh, to answer those particular questions. So he's looking at other data sets involving behavior of children, anything where perhaps uh, a majority of those involved actually would have had a diagnosis of autism. And this can be used to bolster, if you like, the conclusions from the we're also looking at ethical issues as well. This is such, can an early intervention be too early? Um, what measures of quality of life should be used? It's very controversial. How do you trade short-term impact against long-term benefit? This would be a problem if, we, if the choice came to, do we fund uh, research into understanding what autism is in the hope that in the long term this might have some profound effect on the quality of life of people? Or do we put into money, money into something that would affect quality of life now. And it's very difficult to make that trade-off. And we certainly don't want to end up rubbishing uh, bio biomedical research in the area just because it doesn't have a quick, pay, uh, a quick return. What about accessibility and fairness? Uh, if there is an intervention, is it available to all children who have a diagnosis, or all children or adults who have a diagnosis of autism? Um, and cost, of course, comes into that. And how do we meet the contrasting needs of different regions of the very difficult question also. The dialogue with the experts is crucial in answering some of these questions because they are aware of current research which may not even be published yet. They're aware they, they, they can advise on the relevance and significance of findings from the reviews and the relevance of emerging interventions perhaps of which the database is thin at the moment 
and also the identification of parameters to use in the evaluation of the effectiveness of interventions. So for every area that Martin Knapp and his colleagues look at, there will be an expert who can advise and interpret, if you like, and put a, a gloss on, 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 the, on the numbers. So what will be the outputs? And we think at the moment that the main outputs will be something like 20 to 50 case studies, one per topic, illustrating the scope of the project, which covers everything from basic biomedical research and genetics through to the criminal justice system. And it will also illustrate the varying degrees of knowledge that we have on effectiveness and cost effectiveness. So out of this will come our recommendations. Um, there will be those for which we have robust evidence of positive societal and economic outcomes. So that is, we don't need any more research. The figures already speak for themselves. And these will be recommendations at government level for further investment. There perhaps won't be too many of those in which the evidence base is that strong. We don't know yet, but we're still going through the exercise. There will be many for which the evidence base is fragmentary, but expert opinion proposes that further research is merited to determine the benefits of autistic people on the one hand and all the economic case for so doing. So where there are research gaps, we would hope to take these recommendations to the research funders. So this could be the research councils, it could be the uh, research charities, depending on what particular area, what particular level we, we, we see these questions being posed. And we would ask them whether they would consider commissioning research in these areas. And then there will be those for which the evidence base is non-existent, or in fact negative, i.e. this really does not work. And then we would make recommendations to stop wasting money on any further interventions. And in this I'm sure we would be supporting uh, the recommendations of NICE Well, it's definitely a work in progress at the moment. So these are very tentative. These are interventions that Martin Knapp has defined as in. Now, in doesn't mean that he's shown that there is an economic case for continuing or intensifying the level of the intervention. What in means is that he has a bit of evidence both on effectiveness and also on cost effectiveness. So here we have intensive early interventions, things like the, uh, the early start Denver model, uh, ABA, uh, applied behavioral analysis, for example. Um, positive behavioural support in schools or in adults for challenging behaviours, cognitive behavioural therapy for anxiety, uh, certain types of vocational and employment interventions. So that for each of these intervention areas, there's already evidence on both effectiveness and cost. So I think here is where I have to say a word about what effectiveness is. In these contexts, effectiveness is a positive result in the thing that's being examined. So if, uh, let's look at CBT for anxiety. It, since Anxiety is a very common uh, comorbidity for life of autism in both children and adults. Then things that reduce anxiety are probably effective in that way. Uh, some people would disagree, saying that anxiety is part of their core autism, and they don't want that messed around with very much. But, um, thank you very much, but this is not compulsory. So the question here being posed is, is CBT effective in reducing anxiety in those people who wish to have their anxiety reduced? And the answer is yes. Whether it's a cost-effective intervention remains to be seen yet because we haven't completed the analysis, but there are cost figures, there are economic figures for CBT. In intensive early intervention, something like ABA is very controversial. And many people with autism say ABA is actually trying to make them into something they are not. On the other hand, many parents and carers would probably say that ABA for some children has been effective in engaging them more and in, in controlling their different so whether something can be effective, and it might even be cost effective, whether it's valuable, I think, is still something that has to be decided on top. And I think as we go through a discussion of interventions and whether they're effective or not, we'll come across more and more ambiguities, if you like, in the interpretation of the data. That's why we have all these experts. Interventions that are out are perhaps a bit easier. Special diets, dietary supplements, um, chelation therapy, homeopathy, testosterone treatment, these things have all been decided by, not only by us, there's no evidence of effectiveness, and they've all been rejected by NICE for the same reasons. Um, and all we will do here is reinforce what NICE say. And I think we can also afford to be slightly more robust in our opinions. If we feel like it, we don't have to be quite so factual. We're not doing a Cochrane-style review. It doesn't have, our opinions don't have to be based on, on RCTs or anything like that. We can be opinionated if we want to be. And then interventions that maybe, we don't know yet, 
Um, this is almost everything else. It's a huge long list, and there'll be many more. So these are, this is work in progress. There's evidence probably for many of these that um, there's some evidence on effectiveness. And when we talk about how, effect, how robust that evidence has to be, it just has to be robust enough. We don't want to be um, puritanical about this. We want to be pragmatic. If there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that something works, we don't need to commission a clinical trial to say that this is probably effective. And then we can make some opinions or we can do some economic modeling to try and examine the economic case. Many of these things, the evidence of effectiveness will be more anecdotal. And the economic case may not have been tested, in which case we'll do some economic modeling and try and make some projections, uh, whatever, to, to build a, a case for uh, further intervention. This is a very, very long list here, and I'm not going to go through it. And what does an economic case mean? Well, the kind of things we'll look at is, what is the impact on public or private expenditure? Um, these will be the direct costs. What is the impact on societal resources more generally? So most of these might be called the indirect costs, including the hidden costs, such as unpaid support from family and friends. I should have said that the uh, that 32 billion cost of autism is, is divided about, uh, broadly between accommodation and housing, between uh, obviously social services. It's also lost employment. It's the cost not only for the, uh, for the lack of employment of people, of autistic people, but also for their families and carers and the, 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 the loss associated with almost full-time care for someone for, the, for all of their life. Um, does spending on an intervention generate savings in the short and long term, and if so, to whom and when, will be important questions to answer when we're going to various government ministries asking for more resources. If net effect of an intervention is to increase costs, is it nevertheless seen as cost effective because the outcomes achieved are worth it? And we'll have to see what, how we can define worth it. We aim to look at the widest range of economic impacts, separating public, private, and societal costs and outcomes over different time periods as well. So we're looking for things that be short-term gains, of which obviously government will be most interested, and uh, two to five years or longer term five years, where a lot of the biomedical research will probably have its major impact 